I'm kind of a high-minded idealist about the web. I think the web is its own medium, not print, it's not television. And I think that the values that define this medium, the things that make it great, are the web's flexibility, its fluidity, its accessibility. The web can be accessed by people using screen readers or alternate input devices. The web can be accessed by people on fast or slow connections. The web can be viewed on any type of device with a browser. We don't need to splinter and fragment the web to get it to work this way. It naturally works this way. Well, as long as we don't break it. So this philosophy is often kind of summed up as the idea that there is one web. The W3C says that one web means making, as far as is reasonable, the same information and services available to users irrespective of the device that they are using. Now, when you read that, it sounds a little bit like responsive web design. So I think that today, responsive web design is sort of the latest skirmish in the battle for one web. The idea that with a responsive web design, you maintain a single website. You have one set of content that is delivered up against a single URL. What that means is that you maintain one code base. So instead of fragmenting your efforts across a variety of different platforms and screen sizes, your entire team is pulling in the same direction against the same release schedule. And a result, you get more value from your initiatives. This sounds amazing, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, why would anybody ever do anything else? Sadly, if there's one thing that I have learned from my 20 years of web consulting, ain't nothing ever this simple. Livia Labate, who is the former head of UX for Marriott, she led a large-scale responsive replatforming of Marriott.com. She said that she would often go into meetings with her stakeholders, and her stakeholders would say, I, I need more than a responsive site. I need it to be adaptive. Problem is that no one knows what that means. So, yet, when you look around the industry today, there is a continual theme that we need to move beyond res the responsive web. We need to move beyond responsive design and optimize our websites for mobile users. We need to move beyond responsive design and discover context first. We need to move beyond the responsive web to the adaptive web. This guy says we should move beyond responsive and adaptive to something he calls adjustive web design. I, I, I don't know what that guy's talking about. When you read these articles, there's a very consistent theme, which is that adaptive is akin to magic. You will wave your magic wand over your automatically created adaptive website, and it will magically do just exactly what your users want. So in this talk today, I want to unpack some of the definitions of what we mean when we talk about responsive and adaptive. So let's talk about three different strategies that people use for tailoring the experience to devices. The first, as you might imagine, is responsive. The second is adaptive, and the third, my old favorite, the M. website or the separate mobile website. I have a little bit of a model that I'm going to walk through here today, but just, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, let me put out a few definitions. Responsive web design is fluid grids, flexible images, and media queries. It was a term first coined by my business partner, Ethan Marcotte. And one of the things that I really like about responsive is that it has a clear and consistent definition. If you are using these techniques, then your website is, by definition, responsive. In contrast, an M. site, so that's a separate mobile website often served up on its own domain, usually m.company.com, hence the moniker M. So an M. site is a different website that's served only to mobile devices. And because it's a different website, it often contains different information or less information than you might expect to find on the real website. So if responsive has a clear definition, and it's pretty understandable what an M. site is, 
what the heck is adaptive? So I will offer the definition that adaptive means serving something different. I want to unpack a few definitions that we use for adaptive, but I think the big question to ask is, if you're serving something different, what are, based on what? So there's several different techniques that someone, people might use to tailor the experience. One of those is based on device type. So you might use adaptive solutions to tailor the experience to the type of device that someone has. Maybe that's the operating system, maybe that's whether they're on a smartphone or a tablet or a desktop, or maybe it's based on certain capabilities that you can discern that the device has. In contrast, another way that people might talk about tailoring the experience is based on context. Now, I have a very specific definition of context that I use, and it's this. Information that we can glean from the device sensors in order to make determinations about where the user is or what she might be doing. So that might be things like the time of day, but it could also be other data that we can get, like the location, or even you know, other things like perhaps the velocity that the device is going, or the barometric pressure to determine altitude, might all give you some sense of where that user is and what she's doing. A final way that you might choose to tailor the experience is to the person himself. Now, that's often called personalization, and there's a variety of different ways that you might do that. It could be based on that person's age or gender, it could be based on their life stage, like are they in college or are they near retirement, uh, what languages do they speak, what types of relationships do they have. Personalization is one of those giant subjects that's so large, I, I kind of want to sidestep that conversation for now, and actually just focus on the question of when does it make sense to try to tailor the experience to the device and when does it make sense to try to glean information about the user's context? So first, let's unpack a little bit about device-specific targeting. When would it make sense to serve something different, different content, different design, based on what you can know about the device itself or the characteristics of that device? So to get started, I have to confess that there is a very common definition of adaptive out there that is also my very least favorite definition of adaptive. So with this definition, in a responsive site, the design is completely fluid. It fluidly expands to cover all sizes of device, whereas an adaptive solution, in a sense, it's a series of fixed width screen sizes that snap into place at particular screen sizes, often particular device-specific resolutions. If you look at this example here, if you watch how these boxes expand, you will notice they expand completely fluidly in between the breakpoints. A responsive site will work on every size screen, even new devices that may not have come on the market yet, a responsive site will fluidly adapt to them. In an adaptive site, you might often, often think of this as like a series of fixed width designs. If you watch how these boxes expand, they're choppy, right? It feels like they're jumping into place. The benefit here is that a team might be able to imagine that they, instead of creating a fluid site, they are creating a ser series of fixed width designs, often device-specific fixed width designs. Here's a prototype for an adaptive design tool for iOS apps. What this shows is a series of fixed width canvases for iPhone 6, iPhone 6, iPhone 6 Plus in portrait and landscape. Now, a, an adaptive tool like this might come in really handy if you were designing native apps for the iOS platform. Something like this isn't gonna come in handy at all if you are trying to deal with the hundreds, if not thousands, of distinct screen sizes, pixel densities, orientations that you will see on the web. Now, the reason that I don't like this particular definition of adaptive is that I honestly think we should call it like not completely fluid responsive or maybe just badly implemented responsive. And here's why I don't like this. I want to call you back to my definition of adaptive but point out, especially for an audience of CMS developers, that I think that adaptive means serving something different you're getting the server involved to make decisions that you can't do on the client side. So let's go back to this model here, and the first question that we want to ask is, are you serving information into the same URL? So with a responsive site, obviously, you maintain one site on a single domain. Adaptive allows you to sidestep some of the more problematic issues of an MDOT site in that you can deliver a different experience to users, but under the same domain. Google often refers to adaptive solutions as dynamic serving. 
Luke Rabluski coined the term RIF, which stands for responsive and server something. I would argue that that's also another definition of adaptive. Responsive design is client side, which means that the whole page is delivered to the device, to the browser, to the client, and the browser then changes how the page appears in relation to the dimensions of the browser window. Adaptive design is server side which means that before the page is even delivered, the server detects the attributes of the device and loads a version of the page that is optimized for its dimensions and native features. I got this definition from the Huffington Post, which is my most trusted source of news and information about the web. Ethan loves it when I argue the definition of responsive design with him by, by quoting the Huffington Post back, because honestly, what has he got that's gonna argue with that? So I think it's worth noting at this particular juncture that responsive design is Google's recommended approach for building mobile websites. Now, I want to be clear. Google is not going to penalize you in their search rankings if you have a properly maintained MDOT site or if you use adaptive serving, if you use dynamic serving. Heck, Google themselves uses dynamic serving quite extensively for their own products. I would argue that if you have the resources and the, and the money of a Google, by all means, go to town on adaptive strategies. If you're more like the rest of us mere mortals who are concerned with SEO, I think it's worth noting that there is no organization on the planet that is more invested in the idea that you will serve up a single set of content against a single domain than Google. It just makes their job of searching and indexing the web that much easier if you maintain a single website using responsive design. Okay, so the URL question is clear. The next question that we have to ask is, what, what would you want to serve that would be different? The first thing might be that you want to serve different design. So with a responsive solution, obviously you have the same set of code, the same design. With an adaptive solution, you can tailor the design to the device or to the experience. And obviously, with an MDOT site, you're serving different design. So the question then becomes, why would you ever want to do this? In some situations, you may run into problems where you wish to serve a different page to different devices. I worked with a university client this past year, and they had just done a soup to nuts, burn it to the ground and start from scratch, desktop-only redesign of their website. And they came to me to ask, what should we do now on mobile? And so I told them, you should build a time machine and go back in time and not have done that. This proved infeasible. So I then did an audit of their website. And I came back and I recommended that they do a responsive retrofit. So a responsive retrofit means that they would go in and they would recode the front end of the website. They'd drop in some media queries, drop in some breakpoints, and it would essentially then become a responsive site. It wouldn't be perfect by any means, but given that they had already just done all of this work, it seemed like the most reasonable solution. So when I made this, this suggestion, this recommendation in a meeting, it was like this chill came over the room. I mean, you, know, you just felt their body language get all hostile and they're all sitting there like, mm, no, we're never gonna do that, no. And I'm like sitting there in the meeting dragging the browser window closed going, no, you could totally do this. And so finally, one of their executives spoke up and he said, Karen, you obviously don't understand how political our homepage is. <laughs> and I laughed and said, try me. And he said, well, if we go responsive, can we serve a different homepage? I said, of course you can. What, do you think Ethan Marcotte comes over to your house in the middle of the night and yells at you for being a traitor to the cause? I mean, if literally the only thing stopping you from making the other 11 bajillion pages on your website responsive is that you don't want to deal with the stakeholder politics of figuring out how your homepage is going to squish down, then by all means, let's just cut a different version of the homepage and we'll go out to lunch. This is an easy job. Now, I don't even want to make this sound like it's a total cop-out. So, no less than Chris Coyer. Chris Coyer, he of CSS Tricks, he of CodePen, talks about mixing responsive design with separate mobile templates for his own product, CodePen. He said, as they designed CodePen, that there were many pages, many flows, many templates in that site where it made perfect sense to have that be responsive. 
But he said there were particular scenarios, specifically in the code editor, where he felt that they couldn't provide a great experience to users coming in on small screens and users coming in on large screens by doing a purely responsive design. And so what Chris concluded was that they were better off for just those limited and specific scenarios with creating separate mobile templates, adaptive templates, to solve for those problems. I got into a fight on the internet with this guy, Brian Massey, the conversion scientist, uh, who wrote a, what I believe to be a short-sighted and ill-informed article arguing that adaptive was better than responsive. And after we unpacked some of the obviously false claims, what we managed to narrow it down to was, the, was his idea that if you are running a marketing site where you have campaign landing pages that you want to be targeted to mobile or desktop users, and you wish to A-B test different messages, different offers on mobile and desktop, that it makes sense for you to manage those pages adaptively. You should have separate pages for mobile and desktop, because otherwise, trying to manage all of the logic around the A-B tests in a responsive framework is simply too complex. So, I am not a conversion scientist, I'm certainly not an expert in A-B testing, so if there may be scenarios in, under which it makes more sense to try to separate things out cleanly. But in many cases, the problems that you will encounter don't even encompass an entire page. Some organizations find that it makes sense to serve only an individual component or feature on the page adaptively. Beatport is, it's like a combination of Spotify and the billboard charts for electronic dance music. So it's very popular with DJs and they also have a new consumer platform. So they recently replatformed their entire app responsively. So all of the pages, all of the al album and artist content, all of that is responsive. But they ran into a problem with one specific feature. And you might guess it's the audio player. So delivering audio players in a browser is rather complex. And they said they felt that they didn't, they, they didn't think they could provide a really great audio player at every screen size responsively. And so they decided to serve just that individual feature adaptively. So just the player is served up adaptively to small or large devices. Fidelity, which is an investment bank in the US, ran into a similar problem with, can you guess what it is? It's tables. So tables are a huge problem, especially for financial services organizations when they're trying to go responsive, because tables are often very large, and it's difficult to figure out how to present them effectively on a small screen size. Fidelity ran into a specific situation with a table that they have that is sort of an industry standard table. It has an industry standard sort order to the columns. And they ran into a challenge with figuring out how they were going to deliver a great experience to small screens and large screens. If they delivered the, the exact table, then what that meant was that people coming in on small screens would not see some of the most important columns because they were too far to, left, to the left in the table. So they made the decision to rearrange the columns of the table so that users coming in on small screens would see the most important columns first. But then they ran into a similar problem with larger screen users complaining that the columns were out of order. So faced with this challenge, they came to the conclusion that they were better off serving that table adaptively. So they cut two different versions of the table, a small screen and a large screen version, and they served those up to different device types. I have a little secret for you, though, a confession to make. Fidelity came back to me later and said, Karen, turned out that wasn't worth it. We didn't need to do that. Instead of serving that table adaptively, we figured out how to handle that on the client side. We used conditional loading to rearrange those, those columns. And that, I think, is my advice to you. As a rule, if the problem that you are trying to solve is entirely a problem about layout, if it is entirely a problem based on the size of the user's screen, then you should solve that problem fluidly on the client side using responsive design. You don't need to get the server involved to solve problems like that. And if you don't have to get the server involved, you shouldn't. So, when do you need to get the server involved? Well, as you might guess, it's when you want to serve different content. So, a responsive site, for better or for worse, the idea is that you are serving the same set of content to everyone. Adaptive content has been touted as the solution to developing device-specific content or being able to tailor the content to the user. 
And obviously with an M dot solution, you're delivering different content. So I am an advocate for one web. I am an advocate for responsive web design. And frankly, I have some concerns about you know, standing here in 2016 um, with some of the things that I'm hearing in the industry about what adaptive content should be used for or the benefits of using adaptive content for device-specific co content targeting. And when I kind of explore my, my hesitations on this topic, I realize that I have literally only myself to blame for this problem. So I've been talking about adaptive content for five or six years now. I popularized the term. Frankly, the reason I'm standing here today is because of this. And in this talk that I gave in a book that I wrote called Content Strategy for Mobile, um, I popularized a case study from NPR, which is called COPE. It stands for Create Once, Publish Anywhere. Many of you have probably heard of it. Uh, in, this, in this model that they outlined, they maintain a single base of content, one reusable content store. So an article content form could have many objects attached to it. It might have a title, a short teaser, a long teaser, an audio file, multiple images, the body text of the article, and their website might go and ask for a handful of those objects. Whereas their audio player could come in and be like, no, 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 don't give me any of that. Uh, I just want the title and the teaser and the audio file. I don't need any images, I'm a player. Their mobile website could ask for a different set of objects. Mobile apps could ask for a different set of objects still. Heck, they can even dynamically target information into the desktop application of iTunes, which frankly is just showing off. And so when you hear this case study, I think it's really easy to see how it has become the poster child for device-specific content targeting. Hey, guess who just went responsive? Oh, it's NPR. Daniel Patrick Cooper, who is their head of digital, said, we had a phone website and a tablet website and a desktop website, and we really only maintained the desktop website because we just didn't have enough resources to cover all of those fronts. It just wasn't a tenable situation. So now, lest anyone is out there thinking that I'm standing up here recanting my belief that the Earth goes around the sun, uh, there is a huge amount of value that every organization can get from having content that is stored in a more granular form. Having content that is properly content managed, that is not locked to a particular output format, like a web page, content that has the appropriate metadata attached to it so it can be flexible and it can go more places. I have been advocating for this for the last 20 years of my career, and by God, I'll be advocating it for the next 20 years. But the value of this content granularity sort of naturally leads people to make the leap to the idea of being able to target content against a set of variables. If you have more granular content, if you have structured content, then it's possible to adapt to that content. You can create variations of the content for different needs, different devices, different purposes, and then target that out against a set of business rules. In many ways, this is the value and the potential of the web. This is the value and the potential of using a content management system. And I have to confess something, um, which is that basically everything that I know about publishing on the web, everything I know about adaptive content, everything I know about content management in general, comes from the fact that I was the only person at my job in the early 90s who knew how to do a mail merge. And I had to do it using WordPerfect for DOS. You kids and your graphical user interfaces can suck it. So, I believe that when people are talking about adaptive content, the idea that you want to target content, it is really nothing more than a glorified mail merge. It is nothing more than storing variations of your content and then being able to target them out against a set of business rules. So if targeting them to the device itself is not the best idea, perhaps what we need to explore is the idea of targeting information based on context. So I want to remind you again that I have a very specific definition of context. What I mean is information that we can pull from the device sensors, so information like the time of day or the location, the velocity at which that device is traveling, that, that we can then use to make assumptions about what the user is doing. Someone came up to me after I gave this talk a while back and asked, Karen, why is this context? I mean, isn't context something like waiting in line? And yes, of course it is. I believe that's every marketer's fantasy would be to know when the user is waiting in line or you know, engaged in a particular type of shopping behavior so that they might target or tailor the experience to that. But the problem is we can't know when someone is waiting in line. 
All we can know is the information that we can glean from those sensors and then use them to make judgments. I'll we'll give you an example. I've worn hearing aids for the past, say, 35 years, and today um, I have fancy new digital hearing aids that are integrated with my mobile device, and so they have all sorts of like, programming that go along with them. If you know anything about digital hearing aids, they come pr programmed with all of these different soundscapes. So I have a restaurant program, I have an auditorium program, and interestingly, these particular models come with a car program. Now, even more interestingly, the car program is automatic. How the heck do my hearing aids know when I'm in a car? Well, the iPhone will monitor speed and will automatically change to the selected program anytime the iPhone is going faster than 10 miles an hour. Very interesting, right? So they are using information that they can glean from the device sensors. They are pulling information about the velocity of the device and using that as a proxy for my context. But I hope that you can also see that this is a somewhat inaccurate proxy for context. The fact that I'm going faster than 10 miles an hour doesn't necessarily mean that I'm in a car. I could be running faster than 10 miles an hour. I could be bicycling. I could be a human cannonball. Of those options, human cannonball, by far most likely. But when you, look, when you really start to unpack, uh, I often see marketers spinning out these high-minded tales about what they're going to be able to know about the user's context. And to me, oftentimes, these stories that I hear read a little bit like what I like to call personalization fanfic. They're like, wouldn't it be cool if we could scrape people's LinkedIn profiles and then we know where they went to school and we could dynamically target messages about their favorite sports teams? Or someone just told me recently, like, wouldn't it be cool if we could like, see how people look at web pages and then we could know whether they were like, more of a visual learner or more of a kinesthetic learner and then we could dynamically tailor the experience to them based on how they like to learn. Very interesting hypothesis, totally not feasible. In fact, frankly, kind of ridiculous, and I don't even know why we're discussing this. So, Scott Lee Ware is a CMS analyst in the US, maybe many of you are familiar with him. Uh, he wrote a post recently called, Netflix, You Don't Know Diddly About Context. In this post, he outlines a, a scenario which may be familiar to many of you as parents. So, Scott is the father of three children, aged two, four, and six, and when they go out to restaurants, he likes to give them his phone to entertain them. And so in this article, he argues that Netflix is failing. You know, they're succeeding on personalization, but they are failing on contextual targeting because he hypothesizes that what they should be doing is that Netflix should know that when he's in a restaurant, he, he is probably going to be likely to want to watch episodes of Mickey Mouse. So if the, rest, if the phone sees that he's navigated to that restaurant using Google Maps, then time to show Mickey Mouse. And then when he's back home at his man cave watching his 60-inch flat screen, it's pretty likely he doesn't want to watch Disney videos anymore. So Scott argues that contextual targeting is the solution to this problem. I have another scenario, another hypothesis for a solution to this problem, and it is called user accounts. Why? Why? Why would anybody invest in complex and risky device-specific or context-specific targeting when you could just simply create a separate account for your kids and then only ever show the Disney videos on that account? So there's a lot of, I, I, there's a lot of fanfic being, being promoted out there to suggest, well, wouldn't it be cool if we could tailor the information to the device or to the context, and that would provide a better experience for users? But it turns out that, in fact, people don't actually want that. Scott Kelton Jones, who is the VP of Global UX for Expedia, says, what we've discovered as we do our ethnography research, our lab studies, as we watch the mechanics of our sites from an analytics perspective, people make the same decisions regardless of the context. In an article that uh, I believe was sort of purpose-grown in a vat for the express purpose of annoying me, called Responsive Design is Failing Mobile UX, uh, the author hypothesizes that you want to get to know your customers and determine whether they're pre-store, in-store, or post-store. And you'll want to create a different experience for them based on where they are in the path to purchase. 
Now, I might read something like this and think, oh yeah, sure, so maybe you want to use contextual targeting. If you notice that the device is physically in the store, you might want to tailor the experience based on the fact that they're actually in store. No, that's not what this article says. He says, adaptive design enables the customer to have a customized experience based on the device he or she is using. Optimize the customer experience by tailoring the design and the information to the device. No. Do not do that. Just because the user is on a mobile device does not mean that they are physically in store. Just because the user is on a mobile device doesn't mean that they want you to give them different information. A study by Exact Target found that by far, access to content any way I want it is consumers' most important criteria when rating mobile brand experiences. 91% of consumers say that access to content any way they want is important to them. 83% of consumers also say that a seamless experience across devices is important. And that number increases to 87% when they talk to people who own both a smartphone and a tablet. People don't want you to guess what they want on which device. Chris Bolt, who is the program manager for Microsoft who led the responsive rede redesign of Microsoft.com, says, our data shows us quite plainly and clearly that the behavior of people on mobile devices is really all not, not all that different from the behavior of people on the desktop. The things that they're seeking to do and the tasks that they're seeking to accomplish are really quite the same. I will leave you with this. Don't use device as a proxy for context. Too often, I still hear in 2016, people make, see people making the argument that you should tailor the experience to the device because if someone's on a mobile device, that means they're on the go or they're in a store or they need less information. It's simply not true. People use their mobile devices in every context and you can't necessarily glean anything about the user's context or intentions or goals simply based on the type of device she chooses. So what that means is that in the vast majority of cases, okay, like 95% of the time, you will be better off serving the same information to everyone. So you should start out, I mean, first, first principles, develop a really solid responsive site. Make that site lightning fast. Don't worry about figuring out how you need to tailor the experience to the device or to the context right yet. Do this first. If you run into problems with a responsive design, and, and you undoubtedly will, adaptive is not the answer to those problems, or adaptive is not some kind of magical panacea for the problems that you will encounter with responsive. Adaptive is just a different set of problems. If you can solve your problem on the client side, start there. If you don't need to get the server involved, if you don't need to do complex or risky targeting, don't do it. It's gonna be way easier for you to manage and maintain. Now, I know I'm talking at a CMS event, I know I'm the adaptive content lady. Uh, here's what I think is gonna happen. Like, smart organizations are gonna get a really solid, ground up responsive design in place. It's gonna be lightning fast, it's gonna work really well. I mean, I, I would love it if you came back to me two years from now and you're like, Karen, we did it. We, we got the site working, you were right. It solved 95% of our problems. Oh, we still have 5% of our problems. Well, great. Now you're in a much better position to use adaptive solutions in a very specific and limited case. There may be limited scenarios where you do need to target to the device or you do want to target by context, but don't go there first. I will leave you with this last quote from Livia Labate from Marriott again, where she says, it is important to acknowledge that most activities are universal, even if there may also be device-specific needs. By having the web experience unified through a responsive approach, we cover the base scenarios across the board and then can later do a better job of handling, handling device specifics. I want to say thank you, and before I go, I want to let you know if you liked this talk, you will love my new book. It's called Going Responsive, and if you didn't like this talk, that's okay. The book has a lot of other stuff in it. Thank you.